Thank you all for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join you this evening. Um, hopefully, I will be sharing a lot of new information for you, unless I have a bunch of seaweed enthusiasts in the audience. And maybe um, you guys will be familiar with what I'm going to talk about. But I'm a professor down at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. My lab um, studies human impacts on marine ecosystems. We work everywhere from tropical coral reefs to temperate coastal kelp forests right here off California. And we study all things seaweed. Um, why is that? I hope I will be able to convey to you why, why seaweeds are so important by the end of my talk. So I think most everybody knows that global human populations are continuing to rise and are expected to exceed 9 billion by 2050. This places a huge amount of pressure on us as a society to ensure that we're going to have sustainable sources of food and protein to feed this growing population. There's no way that the ocean is not going to play a role in providing um, or acting as an important food source because the ocean occupies 70% of the planet's um, surface. So looking towards the ocean, if we look at what we currently are harvesting out of the ocean, um, global extraction of protein from the ocean continues to rise. Um, however, you'll note that the orange wedge, um, this is wild harvest, that reached a saturating point around 2014, meaning that we've kind of reached the carrying capacity of how much protein we can wild harvest out of the ocean without overfishing. So all of the new harvest from the ocean has occurred through aquaculture. And this trend is expected to increase. There's, again, no way we're going to be able to feed the planet without figuring out ways of farming the ocean. Um, and so new protein sources are needed, and we're going to need to find ways of doing this in a sustainable way. However, when you look to the ocean, we've got a lot of problems, right? We've got a massive plastic pollution problem. There's around 8 million metric tons of plastic that enter the ocean each year. This is all non-biodegradable sources of, of plastic, everything from styrofoam that can last over 500 years in the, in the ocean to our regular single-use plastic bags and water bottles, which last in the environment for thousands of years. Um, we also have polluted water bodies that need to be cleaned in order for us to be able to grow sustainable sources of food in the ocean. When we moved to land, we also see similar challenges in that a lot of uh, places around the planet, the soils have become depleted of nutrients, and so they're no longer um, viable for cultivating large-scale agricultural stocks. So there's a need to find ways of improving soil quality to ensure that we can provide, um, again, food to feed the planet. Uh, we need to find natural organic st soil stabilizers and soil uh, supplements and fertilizers. Um, and of course, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, global climate change is causing huge problems, everything from droughts and, and fires to uh, marine heat waves, um, highest temperatures on record, and the extent of global climate change is really going to be determined by what we do in the next decade couple of you know, years to decades. Um, if we can get a handle on our greenhouse gas emissions, we can slow the rate of climate change, but we have an urgent need to not only reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that we're currently putting into the atmosphere, but we need to find solutions to remove greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere. <clears throat> So this poses several global sustainability challenges. One, food security. Two, the use of unsustainable carbon intensive products like these uh, non-biodegradable plastics, degraded soil quality, and global greenhouse gas emissions and associated climate change. Now, I'm not here to make all of you depressed and continue to hear the narrative that a lot of us get frustrated by. I'm here to share some seaweed solutions that can help solve each one of these global sustainability challenges. So first, what are seaweeds? Some of you might not know. Um, seaweeds are photosynthetic marine organisms. They're typically large, multicellular, uh, the organisms that you find dominating our coastal habitats. They live in shallow coastal waters from the tropics to the poles. They um, are a highly diverse group, so seaweeds aren't just kelp or the things that you see when you walk on the beach. They are represented by thousands of species worldwide. They have three different evolutionary groups based largely on color. You might be familiar with the red, the brown, and the green seaweeds. Um, they all have unique properties 
issues that make them uh, viable for commercialization in all different sectors of society. And they include some of the fastest growing organisms on the planet. Our giant kelp that lives right off the coast of California can grow up to two feet per day, which is like uh, uh, unimaginable. You can almost see it growing with your naked eye. And they're really important for providing habitat, shelter, food. They're very effective at carbon fixation. They're the source of natural products and much, much more. So just some of the examples of things that seaweeds are used for in today's kind of um, economy uh, include a variety of things that are included on the slide, which I'll go into more details about in just a second. So let's take a look at the global seaweed market as it exists today. Um, currently, or in 2021, the, uh, the market size was estimated to be around $9.9 .9 billion um, in US dollars. Um, and it's estimated to have a compound annual growth rate of about 9.6% between 2022 and 2030. So an increasing um, interest and demand for seaweed products. And this is largely due to their high nutritional value, their health benefits, the increased use of seaweeds in a whole bunch of commercial products, such as um, their use as emulsifiers, and their rising demand for use in um, end use industries such as personal care, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, drug discovery, agriculture, food and beverages, and animal feeds. So um, this is a, a very diverse sector where we're not just using seaweed for one thing, um, they're being used for all different types of products with an increasing um, interest and increasing demand. If we take a look at where the US fits in terms of global seaweed production, you'll note that we're way down here in the bottom of this table. Um, we really are not even you know, a drop in the bucket in terms of producing seaweed to fuel the global demand that exists around the world. Um, so this provides a really unique opportunity for us to take advantage of the growing um, demand and interest in seaweed globally. So who are the major players? Um, largely, most of the seaweed produced in the world comes from Asia, and this isn't surprising because Asian cultures have been using seaweed in their societies for uh, hundreds of years for food, for um, medicine, and for a whole variety of, of commercial products. Um, but primarily China, Indo Indonesia, the Philippines, um, and Korea are some of the top producers of seaweed worldwide. Um, in terms of the US, we import over 98% of the seaweed that are, that's consumed or used in the, in the US. And most of that comes from South Korea, Japan, and China. So again, a really unique opportunity for us to capitalize on in just California alone, we have 700 species of native seaweeds that grow right off of our coast that are not being commercially cultivated at this point in time. So let's take a look at our sustainability challenges and see how seaweeds might be able to fit into these different categories. In terms of seaweed as food, seaweeds have been consumed as food for centuries since ancient humanity. Um, Chewed bits of seaweed have been found in one of the oldest humid mins that exist um, that's about 12,500 years old in Chile. Um, in Japan, this is always a fun story, in 600 BC, you could pay your taxes to the government in seaweed. And some of that seaweed was only able to be used by royalty. So this is how important the seaweeds were for Japanese cultures. And of course, in Scotland and Ireland and England and Wales, a lot of coastal countries used uh, seaweed as fodder for sheep. And over time, they found that their sheep and cattle actually grew much more prosperous, um, had you know, larger offspring and produced more milk when they were fed a, a mixed diet that included seaweeds. But this goes back 5,000 years. Um, Seaweeds, when we think about them as food, they're generally tied to Asian cuisines because Asian countries have been consuming seaweed and you know, using seaweed as a uh, wrap for sushi. This is nori or as seaweed salad or in miso soup. These are all things we're familiar with with going to ch uh, Japanese restaurants. But if um, you look more deeply, seaweeds have been consumed across uh, cultures, any culture that has basically um, been tied to a coastline, used seaweed as a source of food. They're known to be highly nutritious, um, but generally underutilized in the US. And the forms that we do have access to are largely either heavily processed, unfortunately, our seaweed salad that I do love that you can get at, at sushi restaurants, it is highly processed. So there are more nut nutritious ways of accessing um, seaweeds. Um, but beyond just you know, being consumed traditionally, seaweeds are a superfood. They're um, one of the most nutritious 
types of leafy green vegetables that we can consume on the planet. Um, there are many articles about this that have come out recently. Um, this was just, you know, uh, uh, this year talking about um, seaweeds are the, the new buzz in 2023. It was kombucha last year, it's seaweed this year. Um, and many articles discussing the health benefits of consuming seaweed. So why is this? They have an order of magnitude more vitamins and minerals than any leafy green we can grow on land. So you think about kale or spinach, seaweeds are you know, off the charts more nutritious than those, those leafy greens. They're really high in soluble fiber and protein. They're low in carbohydrates. They're low in fat aside from omega-3 fatty acids. So you, you think you eat salmon to get your omega-3 fatty acids. Well, where does salmon get those? They get it from their diet by eating algae. And so algae are the ones that produce the omega-3s. And so you can go directly to the source and get really high amounts of omega-3 fatty acids by eating seaweeds. They're a really good source of iodine. So for people that um, need to regulate their thyroid function, seaweed supplements are often used. They have high amounts of calcium for bone health and high amounts of phenolics, which are a form of antioxidant. Um, they stabilize blood sugar, they're good for heart health, and they're known as a prebiotic. Um, so really, really nutritious source of uh, kind of vegetable, if you will. Um, and even in ancient Chinese culture, um, there, you can find text such that there is no swelling that is not relieved by seaweed. So they're known to be really important in reducing swelling and inflammation um, and all kinds of folklore around the things that seaweeds can cure. Um, so when we think about seaweeds as a type of um, nutritional supplement, there are many different benefits that we can achieve by consuming seaweeds. Um, and, and many other things, everything from strengthening eyes and hair health to preventing colon cancer and leukemia, protecting against in influenza, reduced risk of thyroid enlargement, and on and on. So the benefits go, you know, continue to go on. There are very few seaweeds that are poisonous. There are some that might be unpalatable because they have a weird or unpleasant flavor. Um, but for the most part, all seaweeds are essentially um, edible. Um, when we think about where we might be able to get seaweeds for consumption in the US, the East Coast is really the leader in this space, and Maine in particular. The state of Maine has a number of seaweeds, seaweed farms, um, also known as the kelp superhighway. Um, they produce largely sugar kelp, which unfortunately is mostly shipped to Asia for consumption rather than being eaten here in the US. Um, but there are a number of small local farms um, in Maine. Um, and these, again, Maine has um, access to a lot of leasable water and they have um, less permitting constraints, I'll say, than we have here in California. So they're really the leaders in production. But on the West Coast, we have a number of small scale um, companies and new startups that are producing seaweed. Uh, Blue Evolution grows down in Baja, just right down the coast. Um, we have Daybreak, which is local, kelpful, wild harvests their, harvest their seaweed off the central coast. Um, and so there are many options here on the west coast as well. Unfortunately, it's really hard to get fresh live seaweed at this point in time. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to help promote um, local aquaculture where you can access fresh live seaweed as a form of produce. Moving on to just beyond human consumption, when we think about feeding animals that we might be growing either as livestock or if we have aquaculture where we're growing fish to consume, most of the fish that we grow in aquaculture pens, we are feeding wild harvested fish. So we're harvesting fish from the ocean to feed things that we're now growing in aquaculture. And so that's not really helping us solve our problems um, with over harvesting from the ocean. If we want to have a sustainable type of aquaculture, we should be feeding those organisms something that we are growing ourselves that have a low carbon footprint. So we can feed um, farm-raised fish seaweeds, we can feed uh, our livestock, we can feed um, many animals uh, seaweeds that are, that are grown in aquaculture settings that are uh, more sustainable, that don't have this large carbon footprint I already talked about. So all the health benefits that we gain from eating seaweeds, our animals can gain too. You think about um, all of the 
wild harvested fish and fish products that go into animal feed like dog food and cat food, um, seaweeds can provide the same benefits without having to wild harvest those animals from the ocean. We can grow these in aquaculture and get the same benefits. So it's uh, seaweed generally is being recognized as an important sustainable alternative in aqua feed and in even pet food um, to provide protein um, and all those nutritional benefits without extracting these organisms from the ocean. So moving beyond food and feed, we can now think about those carbon intensive products like the plastics and think about what seaweeds might be able to provide um, in terms of alternative sources. The first and probably one of the largest industries right now is called, um, is known as the cell wall polysaccharide industry. And that's because seaweeds produce these compounds known as carrageenan, agar, and alginate. And what those are are thickening agents. They're like gels and they help emulsify things, everything from ice cream to toothpaste and sour cream, shaving cream, anything that has got a thick, creamy consistency, especially if it's non-dairy, will most likely have a seaweed um, polysaccharide or gelling agent in it. And so we have large commercial farms across largely in the tropics growing seaweeds for these polysaccharide industries. Um, they're used, again, in thousands of human food products, um, especially if you are into the, the nut milk and non-dairy products. Um, again, these seaweed emulsifiers are really common to help, you know, if you imagine making uh, almond milk at home, you'd have almonds and water and you grind them up in a blender and for a minute they might stay mixed, but after five minutes all the almonds going to sink down to the bottom. Well, that doesn't happen when you buy the product, you know, at the store. It stays suspended and that's because of these emulsifiers. They keep things kind of in suspension and give them a creamy texture. Um, nonetheless, you know, thousands of products. This is a multi-billion dollar industry alone. Um, and then thinking beyond that, seaweeds are regularly used in the cosmetic industry, again, because of the gelatinous properties that they have. They help retain moisture. They're high in vitamins, minerals, and fatty acids and antioxidants. All those things that are good for our bodies are also good for our skin. Um, they're great moisturizers, and they may even help combat acne. They are also the secret ingredient in one of the world's most expensive cosmetic lines, known as La Mer. It costs about $500 for one of these little jars of cream, and apparently that it has you know, miracle um, properties, and that's largely due to the properties derived from seaweed. Moving beyond cosmetics, seaweeds are also incredibly important in the world of drug discovery. So these organisms have been on the planet for hundreds of millions of years. They have evolved many different unique compounds to deal with living in the ocean such as antimicrobial compounds. So antibiotics can be discovered from seaweeds, um, all kinds of uh, inflammation reducers, as I mentioned, new compounds that may help fight disease. For example, one compound from this red seaweed right here, Delicia, you can see you put a little tiny piece of Delicia in a Petri dish with a bacterial um, culture and the microbes will not grow near that delicia. So it's producing an antimicrobial compound that is actually used on pacemakers and other things that we put inside human bodies to prevent microbes from colonizing these foreign objects when they go into bodies. Um, other substances are being used in clinical trials right now, everything from cancer fighting agents um, to a magnitude of other substances. So this, there's a whole area of research focused on seaweed natural products. Um, and then of course, we can use, because of all of those gelatinous properties that seaweeds produce, they, um, they can be used as a type of bioplastic. So we already know plastic pollution I mentioned earlier is a big problem. But seaweed products can be used to make plastic bottles, plastic food containers, dishes, sachets, coffee and tea bags, food pa uh, packages, plastic cups. Um, this is even a water pod that is encased in like a seaweed shell that you pop in your mouth and the, the seaweed shell dissolves and you just have a little pop of water. This is used in, these have been used in marathons where people can just put a pocket of them or 
fill their pocket with these little water pods and pop them as they're going along. Um, of course, we have a, a group here at UCSD, um, the Algal Biotechnology Group, that's been developing flip-flops and shoes and surfboards out of um, algae-derived products. And so this is really an innovative space. There are not a, a huge amount of companies that are doing this right now, but I think uh, this is a place where uh, kind of the world is, it's endless what we can do, and there's a lot of need for this, right? So um, innovation and, and discovery is, is really ripe in this field. Um, we can also use seaweeds. I was talking about the need to have ways of having sustainable sources to amend our soil on land to help plants, uh, to help our crops grow better. Seaweeds, their tissue is mostly carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus with vitamins and minerals and fiber. So what are our plants on land like? All of those same things. So we can use seaweed simply just mulching it into our soil, um, and that can help improve crop productivity. Um, it requires very little processing, no mining, uh, very little input or resources. We can grow seaweeds just in seawater with natural sunlight collect the, the biomass or tissue, mulch that into our soil, and then see increases in crop yields, uh, larger and more productive fruits. Um, they can act as soil conditioners, again, due to the gelatinous properties they have in their cells, when you mulch that into the soil and then you water the soil, that helps the soil retain water for longer. Um, and so you can really use any seaweeds for this purpose. There are no pretreatments needed, um, and there's kind of endless possibility. This is a really low hanging fruit. Um, of course, you can also go to your local nursery and buy these kelp compost teas. One of these small bottles will cost you $40, and this literally just rotten seaweed. <laughs> so there's uh, money to be made and innovation to be had in this space as well. Um, why do we need to think about using seaweed as fertilizer? Well, some of our macronutrients like phosphorus are non-renewable. We have an, a, a finite supply of phosphorus in the planet. And so at some point, it's expected that we will run out of phosphorus and that that may end up causing this ma massive food production catastrophe. So if we can use and recycle and reuse organic sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, like re recycling seaweeds into our soils, that can be a real benefit. Um, and this isn't just like a cute little idea. This is, these are ideas that are being explored by massive corporations because agriculture is a very big industry, right? So this is a, a, real, a real deal, a real opportunity as well. We can also use seaweeds to clean water. So bioremediation is essentially what it means is using something biological to re remediate a problem. So you could have really polluted water. In this case, um, we can grow seaweed with human waste. So our sewage, we pretty much just, you know, either uh, stick in a pipe and shoot it out into the ocean and let it go. Well, at the end of the day, when you think about after you remove all the toxins and bacteria, human waste and any other animal waste is just carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And so we can use the kind of purified version of, of the waste that we would be dumping in a pipe off the ocean to grow seaweed that we can then use for fertilizer. So this is about recycling things that we're just wasting right now and making products that we can add value to. Um, seaweeds can also clean up really polluted water. So if you go to like San Francisco Bay or somewhere that's been, you know, in the middle of industrial like commercialization for a long time and has a lot of oils and heavy metals and pollutants and toxins and pesticides and things in the water where you would not want to eat anything out of, you can grow seaweed in that water and they essentially just act like a sponge and they will take up all of those heavy metals and toxins that you can then use. You would probably want to just put that in a landfill. You wouldn't certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to eat it and you probably wouldn't want to grow food with it uh, because those are really, you know, heavy, heavy pollutants. Um, but you can use it to help clean water that you might then be able to use for aquaculture or other purposes in the future. Um, there's some recent evidence to suggest that you can even mine precious heavy metals out of seaweeds that have been grown in places where there are these legacy heavy metal compounds. So thinking about as we're starting to run out of these precious heavy metals, we can go to these places where um, you know, heavy metals have been dumped for 
for years associated with just commercial activity, military activity, and then get the seaweeds to suck them up and then extract the, the heavy metals out of the seaweed tissue for reuse again. These are um, precious heavy metals, so there could be um, a lot of value in doing that. Thinking beyond bioremediation and moving into climate change mitigation, um, of course, we know climate change is a, a big issue, and we're expected to see increases in global temperatures um, continuously until we start getting a handle on our greenhouse gas emissions. So when thinking about how seaweeds might play a role in this, there are really two approaches. One, seaweeds can help us remove greenhouse gases that are already here, that are already in our atmosphere. This is called carbon dioxide removal or CDR. If you think about it in the ocean, it's called marine CDR. Um, and we'll talk about that. So this is using, again, seaweeds as a sponge to suck up CO2 that is already here. And then we can think about ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions altogether. This is thinking about ways of preventing those greenhouse gases from even entering the atmosphere. And seaweeds have solutions for both of these different approaches. First, when we think about, you know, what the big, the, the largest greenhouse gases, of course, are carbon dioxide. So let's look at that. Um, thinking about how seaweeds might be able to help remove CO2 that's the, uh, that is already in the atmosphere. Seaweeds are photosynthetic organisms. They simply take up CO2 from the seawater and they turn that into biomass through the process of photosynthesis. As with any plant, they use carbon dioxide to, um, with sunlight and water and turn that into tissue. And that tissue can then be used for various, uh, various reasons. So sea seaweeds, you could have a massive seaweed farm or a natural kelp bed that is simply photosynthesizing all day, growing, turning into biomass or you know, seaweed matter. And then if that seaweed biomass ends up going out and sinking into the deep sea, that is generally considered to be sequestered. In order for something to truly be a marine carbon dioxide removal solution, that carbon has to be proven to be sequestered, which means removed from the system for 100 or more years. And so if the seaweed ends up getting dumped onto the beach, what's going to happen to it? It's going to decompose, things are going to eat it, and it's just going to get respired back into the atmosphere. So that is not sequestration. Sequestration means permanently removed or at least 100 years. So if you go into the deep sea, everything moves really slowly down there. There's no very low oxygen. There's not a lot of microbial activity. And so it just kind of sits there. And so... This is one way that we can use seaweeds to potentially sequester carbon. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty here, and it's definitely an area of uncharted water. It's an area that's very um, hot and buzzing because of the potential to have carbon offsets generated in the ocean. That's a whole other talk I could give, um, but happy to answer questions about offsets if, if you're interested. Um, nonetheless, there are a number of companies right now that are selling unverified and uncertified carbon credits for growing and sinking seaweeds, which I'm sure will end up being very controversial down the line because there's no way to prove if you grow seaweed and you sink it that it's actually going to stay there for 100 years. You can't go, you can't take a time machine and actually prove that that biomass is still there. What if there's some major disruption event and, you know, that seaweed ends up being consumed or some microbes figure out a way to, to utilize that biomass? So uh, it's, there's a lot of potential here, but I will just say that it's controversial and there's a lot of research and innovation that needs to be done in this space. Um, However, seaweeds can be used to reduce CO2 emissions, not just let's take the CO2 that's already here and remove it, but let's prevent those emissions from ever happening. Um, so one, there are many things that can happen. If we grow large amounts of kelp for say bioplastics, we're now replacing a plant-based product with something that was synthetic that cost a lot more carbon to produce. And so we're reducing the carbon footprint of that plastic industry by generating plastic from kelp. So that's reducing how much emissions would have normally been, been released had we not had the seaweed solution. Um, 
there are many other industries um, that are like this. So even if we're growing kelp for food and we're doing it here in our backyard and we're consuming kelp that was grown locally, we're not sticking seaweed on a container ship and sending it halfway across the planet to import it from Asia and releasing all of the emissions that it would cost to import. We're growing locally, we're eating locally, and that has a reduction in carbon footprint as well. But many different things that seaweed products can help replace more carbon intensive industries and help reduce those emissions overall. Um, but there are some much larger scale options that exist that could have a much, much larger impact. So let's move from CO2 and let's think about methane. Um, methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And while it is less abundant, it actually is way more potent in terms of its warming potential than carbon dioxide. Um, methane can trap or it can uh, generate up to 30 times more warming potential um, tw or 23 times more heat over a 100 year cycle than carbon dioxide. So that means for one molecule of, of methane, it's 30 to, around 30 times more potent than CO2 and its ability to warm the planet. Um, however, the good thing about methane is that it only sticks around in the atmosphere for about 10 to 12 years, whereas CO2 is in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So if we can find a solution for er, uh, re reducing methane emissions in our lifetime, we could actually see those climate change impacts. Um, so methane is a big target for trying to find ways of reducing emissions. So where does methane come from? Most of the methane that is released by humans um, in, the, in the atmosphere comes from agriculture and agricultural waste followed by fossil fuel production and use. Um, so agriculture, yes, I'm largely referring to livestock. Um, and in specific, if we look at closer at methane emissions from cattle, uh, milk and beef supply chains, you'll see that the green uh, or turquoise wedge is the largest and that is largely coming from enteric methane. What does that mean? It means that when um, livestock consume their food, they have a very complex digestive system involving multiple stomachs and a lot of bacteria. And as they're digesting their food, they uh, produce methane as a waste product. And while most people think that methane comes out of one side of the cow, actually, most of it comes out of their mouth. Um, so up to 95% of the methane that livestock produce comes out of their mouth, while 5 to 10% comes out of the other end. Um, and historically, there hasn't been really any solution for reducing methane emissions in livestock. If we look at the global livestock industry, um, it is responsible for around 14% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and this is roughly equivalent to the entire global transportation industry. Planes, trains, automobiles, um, you name it, they're all included. So let's think about cows versus automobiles. Um, a single cow produces roughly the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions as an automobile traveling around 50,000 miles per year. Um, so yes, cows and cars are quite equivalent. And while the automobile industry has an option to going electric, we do not yet have a Tesla for the cow. Um, historically, this was the solution for capturing methane out of livestock. They literally would put a straw down the cow's mouth and every time they burped, they would fill up this backpack with methane. And now you have literally a, a ticking time bomb flammable cow that if someone happened to drop a match nearby, that cow would literally explode. And it has happened before. So this is obviously not sustainable, not scalable, and you're not really removing the methane, you're just capturing it and then probably using it for fuel or for another purpose. Um, so let's walk onto the stage, our seaweeds, um, of course, Livestock scientists for years have been trying to find supplements that they could feed cows that would help reduce methane emissions. Um, they've looked at all kinds of plant extracts, garlic, lemongrass, oregano, um, you name it. So then this study back in 2014 screened a whole bunch of different types of algae and seaweeds. And what they found was that this one red seaweed known as asparagopsis led to a massive reduction in methane. This was in, of course, petri dishes with livestock, um, uh, with microbes from their guts. 
Um, so they needed to follow up with actual uh, in, in vitro studies. Um, but nonetheless, this was really exciting. This was a really high, showing really high efficacy, much higher than any other, um, really any other plant material that had ever been tested and so showed a lot of promise. Went on to doing a number of other studies. Um, a whole bunch of different scientists around the world have now published uh, several dozens of papers, all showing that whether you feed um, the supplement to dairy cattle or beef cattle or sheep, or other ruminant animals that um, the results are consistent and you regularly can get up to 90% reduction in methane emissions with this, the feed of this little red seaweed. And I'm not talking about feeding you know, half of the diet of these animals this red seaweed, we're talking about just a half to 1% of their daily consumption. So it's like a supplement, um, you just sprinkle it over their feed. Um, and so over and over again, results are consistent. There have been no negative effects on the health or well-being of the animals or the products, whether it's the milk or the beef. Blind taste tests, could, nobody could find any or detect any differences. Um, again, the animals are not eating a huge amount of seaweed, so you wouldn't expect it to massively change the quality of their products. Um, so yeah, more research was needed largely because how are we gonna grow enough of this beautiful, delicate red seaweed to feed the uh, almost greater than 1 billion cows on the planet? Um, all of the research up until around 2017 had been focused on the livestock side of things. Um, and so this is where I came onto the scene. This is one of the big things that my lab studies in addition to many of the other topics I talked about today. But we've been growing asparagopsis in our lab for the last five years. Um, currently still the largest limitation is access to the seaweed. Uh, wild harvest is not possible. There's just not enough of this red seaweed in the field to wild harvest it. So we need to develop aquaculture um, based approaches for commercial cultivation. And it needs to be informed by research. Um, and our group here at SIO is, is one of the ones leading the effort on the research and development of this little red seaweed. So you may have seen uh, we've been in the news a bit because of the, you know, all the funny jokes people can make about cow farts and burps and seaweed and whatnot. So it's been a fun space to work in. Um, right now, our team is focused on collecting the seaweed from a whole variety of different locations to try to identify if there are certain strains that are better performers than others. We're working on optimizing cultivation. So what factors uh, help the seaweed grow the fastest and produce the highest concentration of this bioactive compound that it produces, which makes it um, so efficacious at reducing methane. Um, and then helping to develop some kind of commercialization approaches. We've partnered with a startup that's based in Hawaii called Pollution Barns, which is now commercially growing it on several acres and um, hope to have it in the mouths of animals soon. Um, how, you know, what's the kind of impact that this one little red seaweed could have if we were able to feed it to all of the cattle on the planet? Um, we're talking about 220 trillion pounds of methane per year. So that's how much the whole um, livestock industry produces. And if, if we're getting even like a conservative estimate of, you know, 80 to 90% of methane reductions, we could, you know, have a really significant impact on reducing methane emissions um, or preventing those methane emissions from even entering the atmosphere altogether. So um, I hope through this quick and brief whirlwind of uh, the amazing worlds of seaweeds that you guys have seen, that they represent a vast diversity of organisms. They have huge potential to improve sustainability across many different sectors, and they will certainly play an important role in helping increase sustainability in the future. Um, education, collaboration, innovation, and science are gonna be the key to the success of this industry, so that's where being at UCSD is so fun. So thank you, and I'll take questions. Thank, thank you, Dr. Smith. That was amazing. Um, so maybe there is a silver bullet. This is the closest I've ever heard of a silver bullet to a climate solution. Yeah, it's just scaling. Um, it's always a scaling challenge. Um, yeah, thinking about growing the red seaweed, you know, it's hard to grow in the open ocean, which is where all the space is. 
uh, because it's so delicate. Um, but the, because, yeah, we're, we're largely focusing on land-based aquaculture. Um, and, you know, there are parts of the world that are really supportive of large-scale land-based aquaculture. In the U.S., um, we don't have a lot of coastal property that is accessible that's not worth billions of dollars. And so um, finding ways to kind of break down some of the barriers to do large-scale production is what we're working on. Yeah. All right. I'm going to... Oh. Hi. Hi. Take, take the mic and tell us your name. Okay. Ann Usher. We spoke yeah. a while back. Hi. Hi. Nice Good to see you, you in person. Um, so I studied this a bit, um, and I wonder if you could touch on, uh, as you know, I, um, Luke Gardner's study, he and other folks, they were studying, as you're probably well aware, um, they were. T they think they tested something like 10 different species, you know, all of them deemed before the trial deemed to be safe for cattle, uh, dairy cows, and um, and test for efficacy. They found, like you have, that AT performed the best. I think that was the result, but. I was waiting for publication on that, and one of the things I wanted to note that you hit on was the the catch with it, um, it with AT is that it's really fragile, and as you said, it's hard to grow at scale. Um, I was told about a year and a half ago that there were one of the, that, that the preliminary results that they had found that two other species cut enteric methane emissions almost as much as AT, maybe not exactly, but like close, but that they're easier to grow. I wondered if you could touch on those and sort of that, because I, I know that that's been a big point with us. Yeah. Um, are there other species that have similar um, potential that might be easier to cultivate? Um, I have only heard of a few studies. I haven't seen anything new published, but the closest that I've seen is maybe like 30% reduction. So it's not the 80 to 90% that you get with asparagopsis. Um, These were in the eight, close to the 80 range. Do you have okay, I haven't seen that. Um, and you know, I wouldn't shy away personally as a scientist from something that's difficult. Um, we've been successful at cultivating this seaweed for five years and can get up to 50% increases in growth rate in a day when they're growing really happily. So um, that's where research and innovation, you know, needs to come into play rather than just going for the, the lowest hanging fruit. Sometimes um, the other issue is like we can't feed cows a large amount of seaweed because there are other factors that come into play. They end up getting, um, the milk will end up being really high in iodine because seaweeds produce a lot of iodine. They'll have other things they don't like the taste of that much salt. So there are other challenges with um, things that you would have to feed more of. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Randy Camp. And I was wondering, given that this is a fragile seaweed, is there any research going on to understand the um, DNA involved in this and then be able to put that into a easy to grow seaweed? Yes, so there is one startup based out of Australia who's working on trying to, to do more synthetic production of the compound. Um, we have collaborations that are working on the biochemical pathway that um, leads to production of the suite of compounds that are believed to be um, the effective compounds of reducing methane. Um, I'm not a bioengineer, but that's certainly where collaboration and thinking about, you know, the resources on this campus could provide unique opportunities. Um, I'm currently trying to fundraise to develop a center of excellence for seaweed studies at UCSD. So this could be a great hub for bringing together people across campus to do things like that. Yeah. On, on Monday, I saw a lecture by uh, SIO researcher, uh, Drew Lucas, I think mm -hmm. his name, he talked about red tides, and th I think there was a strong connection between kelp and um, maybe these microbes taking nitrogen from kelp and affecting the environment, you know, yeah. that's effect adversely affecting fishing. Are you familiar with his research and yeah. the tie-ins to red tides? We're having a red tide right now, which is can be fun because they're bioluminescent at night. So if you get onto scripts, you'll be able to see the waves glowing. Um, and that's natural. Um, the species typically, or the genus is Lingulodinium. It's a dinoflagellate. Um, 
we have correlations of what leads to the blooms and senescence, but certainly we had a bloom right during the beginning of COVID that lasted for five days and led to complete hypoxic conditions in the ocean. As the bloom died, um, all the microbes that were eating the the blooming algae um, consumed it all and sucked up all the oxygen and released a bunch of CO2. So we had complete dead zone off the Scripps Pier for four days. So um, when things like that happen, when those algae are blooming that intensely, certainly they're going to be taking nutrients away from the kelp. Our kelp has been suffering here in La Jolla for since the last big El Nino, and we're set up to have another one this year. So that's another area of research I didn't get to talk about, but my lab does a lot of work on kelp forest ecology as well. <clears throat> um, Joshua Discar. Um, so I was thinking about how um, public awareness is very often spurred by um, private um, production, especially with pandemic and like a lot of my family had been growing new plants that they hadn't been interested in doing before. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, how hard is it to grow seaweed in my backyard? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, if you, so ultimately to grow seaweed on land, you really need seawater and sunlight. If, um, if you're growing it in a closed system where you don't have seawater that's constantly flowing from the ocean, um, you would need you would need to fertilize it, <clears throat> and then of course um, keep it at a temperature range that's kind of within normal. But like if if you go to places like Okinawa in Japan, their like supermarkets have just live tumbling tanks of seaweed that you can grab fresh and buy. So if your environment, if your outside environment is similar to the temperature conditions in the ocean, you can really just grow it on the counter. Um, so a lot of the red seaweed that we're growing right now is in closed conditions in the lab, not on flow through, just with, we do use artificial lights. Um, so yeah, the bottom, the bottom line is sunlight and seawater and appropriate kind of temperature conditions. Um, and then, yeah, if you're into like Aquarius, like being a hobbyist, um, there are all things that you can tinker to make things grow better and faster. And, um, but yeah, happy to chat more about that. If you were just carrying seawater instead of having a system. <laughs> if you were just carrying the seawater instead of having a you know, your own supply directly tied in, uh -huh. how f frequently would you have to refresh? Um, so if you're growing seaweeds, the main things that are going to be depleted are nitrogen and phosphorus. So you can get away without doing a complete refresh by augmenting with fertilizer. Um, something that grows really fast is going to take up those nutrients really quickly. And so you'll want to find a way of, of augmenting. But there are plenty of companies that um, only do kind of partial refreshes um, that are growing, you know, isolated from the coast. Um, the company that I work with, yeah. Yeah. Like you can get big trucks that you can fill up. Uh, we offer free seawater to the public at Scripps. We have a big spigot right at the Scripps Pier. So you can just go fill that up and bring your bucket home and start playing with it. <laughs> Small scale citizen science. I'm gonna ask one last, well, okay. I'll let you do a question I have a closer. So okay. last question from the crew. Hi, my name is Bob. Uh, how will the increased water temperatures impact some of the seaweed cultivation, especially like the cold water specific species? Yep, good question. And um, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts there, right? So like in San Diego, we're seeing what I call species are on a climate creep. So we're seeing warmer water things that are more traditionally more prevalent in Baja and Mexico, kind of creeping up into our waters where our giant kelp, which is really cold water dependent, has been kind of suffering and senescing. Um, so certainly warming temperatures will be a big factor. That's where a lot of research is going into trying to identify thermal tolerance in species that are cultivated. So just like any crop or any organism, you know, some of us, I'm going to probably get sunburned a lot faster than some of my friends, some of you in the audience, there are going to be some individuals of kelp that are going to be able to, to weather the, 
the heat better than others. So that's where using science to help inform industry development will be important, but it is going to be a big factor. So I'm going to ask you one question. Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you. Um, this is inspiring. If you had un unlimited resources, and you know now we, we can control organisms, synthetic biology is on the rise, powered by AI, and you got to make one, uh, one super seaweed to save the world, <laughs> what would you do? Yeah, I mean, I really think the red seaweed, that asparagopsis, has got the largest potential to have the biggest impact in the shortest amount of time. Um, so I would alleviate resources for large land-based cultivation, and I would help um, remove barriers for permitting. Um, the nice thing about that red seaweed is that it grows almost all over the planet. Um, it exists between, like, 40 degrees north and south of the equator um, in all of the different ocean basins. And so thinking about global production, you know, you build a network, um, you cultivate it in open ocean and places that's feasible and where countries are amenable. But, you know, I think it's, I do think it's doable. It's just, and there's already been a lot of financial investment in that seaweed, but all these companies are working separately and they're competing and they're not collaborating, and not any one of them will ever be able to supply the, wor the whole world with all the seaweeds they need. You know, I mean, there's just too many cows. So collaborating and, um, and working together, building an a innovation team, um, you know, I mean, we've done it with how many land-based crops? Yeah. We didn't just start growing rice like overnight and corn and sugar cane. So if we had that same sort of investment in the seaweed from a scientific and a financial perspective and a business development perspective, I'm sure we could get there. So if you want to save the world, just listen to this person over here. <laughs> and if you're online and you have a billion dollars, give it to Dr. Smith. We know how to do it. Um, we're really honored to have you. We're thankful. Your questions are wonderful. I'm glad the folks in the audience enjoyed themselves. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.